It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The International Monetary Fund released its biannual 300-page World Economic Outlook last week. Overall, the outlook presents a fairly optimistic picture in the short term for the global economy. However, in the medium term to long term, it is concerned about increasing inequality, environmental degradation, and a growing backlash against globalization. Joining me to analyze the IMF's World Economic Outlook is Mark Weisbrod. Mark is the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research and is the author of Failed, What Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy. He joins us today from Washington. Thanks for coming on The Real News, Mark. Thanks, Charmini. Thanks for having me. So, Mark, uh, the IMF and I should say also the World Bank wrapped up their annual fall meetings last Sunday with gatherings of finance ministers, powerful central bankers and economists. Um, when we mentioned IMF or the World Bank to most people, their eyes glaze over. Why should we care about their meeting and uh, why are these meetings so significant for all of us? Well, the IMF is really the most powerful financial institution in the world in many ways. It has an enormous influence on policy, uh, even in Europe, where it's really the European directors that make the main decisions. They're still kind of the brain trust for the austerity that you've seen in Europe for a lot of policies that affect uh, developing countries. And so, you know, you have right now a recognition that the global economy and globalization hasn't worked too well in some of the high income countries, the United States, the UK, there was Brexit, of course, in the Eurozone, there's been a lot of problems. And, uh, but a lot of people defend it. A lot of people defend the kind of globalization that's designed here in Washington as something that really helps the poor, the majority of people in the world. And so here's the IMF and the World Bank. They're the main ones that have this influence. They have real power too because in some countries a lot of countries if you don't get uh, agreement with the imf uh, you won't get loans from the world bank or from regional banks or sometimes even the private sector so this is real power it's very concentrated here in washington and it's kind of part of a a neo-colonial uh, system where the rich countries which control these institutions, really, even though the IMF has 189 members, it's really just the U.S. and its rich country allies that make the decisions, and they don't necessarily make it make them in the interest of developing countries. Now, when you look at uh, the IMF documents, they say wonderful things. For example, they say, we reinforce our commitment to achieve strong, sustainable, balanced, inclusive, and job-rich growth. And to this end, we will use all policy tools, monetary and fiscal policies, and structural reforms, both individually and collectively. Now, these are all great feel-good sentiments. Uh, we have um, our reporter, Dimitri Lascaras, actually in Greece, taking uh, a look at uh, the impact IMF policies has had on Greece and the ordinary people through austerities and, and things that they're forcing the government to do, sell off their uh, utility companies and anything that our national assets are being asked to be sold off so that the loan uh, uh, given to them by the IMF and the Troika could be paid off. So give us a sense of what all this talk is in theory and in practice. Well, the IMF is changing some in its research department, and that's where you see the changes in, in theory. You do see a lot of these acknowledgments in the latest World Economic Outlook that, you know, there's too much inequality, that uh, even that there's a need for governments to spend money, that is expansionary fiscal policy, that governments should spend money in order to reduce unemployment. And But when it comes down to it, if you look at their actual policy, that has not changed much at all. And you mentioned Europe. You can look at the papers that, you know, every 
country that's a member of the IMF has to do a paper about once a year jointly with the IMF, and that kind of shows what the consensus is on policy. If you look at France, you know, the IMF is supporting these so-called labor law reforms that reduce the bargaining power of unions, even though they say they care about inequality, and they are helping to push for uh, France to have more uh, austerity, to reduce their spending, to tighten their budget, even though unemployment is 9.5 percent. If you look at Spain, for example, again, just the IMF's own papers jointly with the right-wing government, you see, again, these agreements. You see uh, unemployment is at 18 percent. It's supposed to go down to 16 percent in about a year and a half. But that's basically as far as it goes, and the IMF is kind of redefining this as full employment for Spain. That's one of the reasons you have so much unrest in Spain right now. It's because the economy is doing so badly. But here's the IMF saying it really can't do much better. So in that sense, you know, the IMF is still the same IMF. The places where there is some positive change, of course, is on monetary policy. And that's because the two biggest and most important central banks in the world, the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank have both changed their monetary policy in, over the last decade in very positive uh, directions, that is, in directions that do promote uh, more employment, They're very low interest rates, uh, quantitative easing, which I'm sure you've talked about on this show. Those things uh, are a positive change, and that came uh, from these uh, powerful uh, central banks. And the IMF uh, is okay with that up to a point. They still support, at least tacitly, the you know the Federal Reserve raising interest rates here, which of course is going to keep a lot of people from getting jobs, and is probably the greatest threat to our uh, our economy here uh, here in the United States. Right. Mark, um, one of the things that uh, there's been a lot of talk about is the issue and I guess the theory and the practice of globalization, um, which most left economists or progressive economists, I should say, critique. But people around the World Bank and the IMF uh, claims that globalization is a great success, um, at least for the majority of the people in developing countries, they say. so. What are their arguments in favor of globalization, and does it hold up in terms of evidence? Well, here we looked at the, this recently in one of our, our papers, and you know you have these statements from politicians as well. You know, President Obama, in his last speech at the United Nations, said that uh, over the last 25 years, the number of people living in extreme poverty has been cut from nearly 4%. 40% of the world to under 10%. Now, that's a World Bank statistic, and there's a lot of dispute over that. But just even taking it at face value, if you actually look at what happened since 1990, it's two-thirds of that poverty reduction, extreme poverty reduction, was in China. And if you go back a little further from 1981 to 2010, 94% of that uh, net reduction in people living, living below the extreme poverty line was in China. And, and even the part that wasn't in China, a lot of that was a result of China's growth and importing, increased imports from developing countries and increased investment, you know, as China became the largest economy in the world. So Chinese globalization has done very well. China's income per person has multiplied 21 times since 1980, the fastest uh, economic growth in history. But if you look at what they did, it's a lot of it, most of it's the opposite of what these Washington institutions and what even President Obama was uh, describing as globalization in his speech. So, you know, they had foreign investment, but they controlled it, and they still have it. They control it to fit with their own development plans. They have technology uh, transfer as much as they can get. They have performance requirements, you know, require uh, foreign investment, for, uh, foreign investing firms to do certain things that promote local management skills and uh, things like that, export promotion. They have a state, mostly state controlled uh, financial system for most of this period and still a lot, uh, quite a bit uh, today. The central bank isn't independent, which is the main thing, one of the main things that Washington pushes. So this is the kind of globalization they have. And in the rest of the world, 
the rest of the developing world is very different. You have this kind of indiscriminate opening to international trade and capital flows. You have the central bank being independent of the government, so it's not really uh, subject to public uh, control. It's more re responsive to the financial sector. You, they got rid of these industrial and development policies that used to be successful and were successful in, in China. And all this other, you know, financial deregulation and other deregulation. And if you look at what happened uh, in these last 25 years in, in, in the vast majority of developing countries outside of China, the ones that did the kind of globalization that President Obama and all these officials at the IMF, the World Bank, are talking about and calling a success, and the media usually calls it success, they did very badly. Uh, overall, uh, they grew, uh, the, well, in the in the 80s and 90s, they they had a terrible economic failure, and they really didn't recover until the 21st century, when uh, a lot of what happened uh, was China helped uh, pull them out, and then their policies also changed as the IMF lost uh, most of its influence in the middle-income countries. So. Uh, there really isn't uh, much evidence that globalization has been a uh, success for the vast majority of uh, developing countries. All right. Now I have a very specific question for you. Mark, if you were Christine Lagarde and head of the IMF, uh, and I know IMF and the World Bank has different ways and approaches and, and mandates, but what developments would you introduce to contribute to economic growth in the short term? Well, how would you guide the global economy? And what are the developments that will contribute to addressing the problems of inequality in the world from your perspective? Well, those are two really big things. I guess the short answer is uh, to first allow for the things that the IMF says in the IMF research department says are often necessary, which is to have expansionary fiscal policy, to have the this, you know, the government invest in infrastructure that's necessary even in the rich countries to uh, to support their commitments to uh, that they made uh, to reduce uh, climate destruction. For example, we need inf infrastructure investment, and energy and and transportation and so on. So uh, this is something that progressive candidates in Europe have supported in parties and uh, but they don't get any they get they get pushback from the European authorities and the IMF. So in the rich countries, I think that's the main, you know, especially in Europe, where you have really still a very high unemployment. I think that's really needed. And of course, that would, if you promote more employment, you get you reduce inequality. Uh, in the U.S., I think the main threat going forward, as I mentioned, was the Federal Reserve. As they if they raise interest rates, most of the recessions, almost all almost all the recessions in the U.S. since World War II, except for the last two, were actually caused by the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. So that's a big uh, threat to us here. And of course. In the most developing countries, they need uh, more of the kinds of policies that were successful in the past and that China used successfully in the more recent past, which includes real uh, development uh, planning, real industrial policy, and again, uh, getting away from the kinds of austerity, unnecessary austerity that the IMF has uh, too often recommended that prevent them from from growing or sometimes even uh, push the economies into recession. All right, Mark, I thank you so much for joining us today and for your insights. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.